So for our next session, I'd like to introduce uh, Christopher Vandermeid. Chris, Christopher is a, has a degree in neuroscience with a computer science minor from the University of Amsterdam, as well as a master's in information science. He currently works as a security focused uh, developer advocate in Cisco's DevNet program. So today he's gonna be talking to us about automating some of our key threat hunting workflows to help scale up our hunting and our incident response capabilities. So thanks for joining us today, Christopher. Um, so as mentioned, my name is Christopher von der Maade. I work as a developer advocate at Cisco. And today I'm going to talk to you about automating your threat hunting workflows. Um, now, before I wanted to do that, I wanted to open with this picture. And basically, um, I, wanted, I want you to imagine uh, to drink out of this fire hydrant. Uh, that is sometimes, if I speak to uh, security operation center analysts, that's sometimes how they feel. And uh, it's just because there's so much information coming at them. And um, to start off the presentation, I wanted to uh, open with this statement. And at the end, we'll come back to this statement and we'll see um, if you agree with me a bit more, uh, if you don't already. Now the statement goes that there's simply too much information out there. And the focus here is to consciously consume. So therefore we need to automate as much as possible and provide bite-sized cases to us humans uh, who actually will then need to um, handle that uh, incident. Um, so that's what I'm talking to you about today. Um, I have the following agenda for you. Um, first, I'll do a short introduction into threat hunting. Obviously, everyone here on, the, on, the, on this event knows what threat hunting is, but I guess if I ask all attendees here, I will get as much different answers as, um, as we have attendees. So I wanted to set the ground a bit, and I also wanted to mention which parts of threat hunting today I want to automate. I'll then do a short introduction into SecureX, which is a free Cisco tool. Um, I will also mention a couple of alternatives, also open source, but I'm just using it as example because uh, yeah, I have it laying around as a Cisco employee, obviously. I will then talk about two use cases, and this is really where my presentation is about, is finding indicators to use in your threat hunting. And I'm going to use Twitter uh, as my first uh, use case. Um, and I'm gonna, going to show you a demo of that as well. Then I also have a way of ingesting RSS feeds. Um, so blogs specifically. Um, I, don't, uh, I will not be able to show that demo because of the time um, a crunch in the 30 minute window. Um, and especially not after uh, losing a couple of minutes in the beginning due to a mic issue. Um, but I do have a YouTube video on my GitHub where both of these scripts are uh, hosted, uh, which you can view um, to, to see more details. And finally, we'll conclude um, with some final statements. So let's jump right into it. So what is threat hunting? Um, sometimes uh, when I describe to non-IT or non-security friends what threat hunting is, they usually talk about, uh, they think it has anything to do with being very stealthy and sneakily uh, walking around and trying to, um, uh, to, to hunt for hackers. Well, in some cases, this might be true, but also in many cases, um, you don't have to be that stealthy. You can just go and search, um, search your internal monitoring systems. Obviously, when you want to lure a hacker with, for example, a honeypot or something, you want it to make it look as real as possible and not as a trap. Uh, but today, um, it's actually not, not the case. So threat hunting is the process of proactively and iteratively searching through networks to detect and isolate advanced threats that evade existing security solutions. So basically, the, the idea here is um, focus on proactive and iteratively. So we're going out there and finding new incidents, and we're doing that on a continuous basis, uh, as, as opposed to more incident responding, which is, yeah, literally responding to uh, incidents. Um, 
Now there's different types of hunts. Uh, we have an intelligence driven hunt. Uh, these are usually low hanging fruits. These are known threats. Um, and uh, yeah, so you can quite easily hunt for these. You then have TTV driven tactics, techniques and procedures driven hunts. Uh, this is a little bit a next level, basically. Here you need to look for specific methodologies that are used by attackers. And yeah, so, so you're not just looking for a specific indicator, but you're more looking at, um, yeah, a, a specific method that is being used. Finally, level three is anomaly driven. And here we're, yeah, we're not looking for uh, known threats or known methodologies. We're looking at behavior, so sort of outcomes that could happen if you get attacked. So this is usually the more advanced uh, threat hunting. Now, obviously, there's solutions for all of these levels to do this uh, automatically. Uh, but there's always hunting that you can do on top of the, this uh, when you uh, work as a security analyst. Today, I'm going to show you how to automate the most simple one, the intelligence-driven uh, hunting. And uh, yeah, this is important um, because we want to keep time as a precious thing. And we want to keep this to important things as much as possible. So we're not going to do low-hanging fruit hunting manually, uh, or, and we're not going to spend time on it. So uh, that is basically my goal of my presentation is to show you how you can do that. Um, now the hunting loop, um, you, you might be familiar with this and there's also other uh, models out there that show how, how uh, threat hunting can be done. But it usually starts with an hypothesis uh, stating, hey, I think this and this happened and this needs to be true in order to prove my uh, hypothesis. And this is how I'm going to test for it. So you're gonna do some investigations, you're going to uncover new patterns, and then you wanna enrich that information. So, uh, or enrich that data to become information. And especially this enrichment part is quite easy to automate, uh, or at least a lot of aspects of it. Obviously you can automate more uh, as well, but this is a, uh, an easy one to start out with. Um, now here is a maturity model, um, which I wanted to point out something between the first and the fifth level is that the fifth level actually states that you automate the majority of successful data analysis procedures. Whereas if you look all the way at the first level at level zero, you see that it relies primarily on automated alerting. Uh, so that is basically, uh, yeah, your, uh, your, the most, most organizations probably are at the lower levels right now. Um, and I wanna show you today how you can jump a couple of levels. Now, if you look at threat hunting, you can do that on demand. Uh, so the, um, and what I mean with on demand is that you say, hey, I'm going to hunt for this, or you can do more of an automated and continuous hunt. Um, and the automated and continuous hunt uh, focuses a bit more on taking in information, uh, doing something with it, going out and hunting for that, uh, for specific results, and then um, taking action if needed. So um, today I'm going to focus a bit more on that, the right type. Um, the pyramid of pain, uh, probably also known to many people, um, is also um, important today. Why? Um, I was talking about low-hanging fruit earlier. And what I actually mean with low-hanging fruit is actually the, the first four layers of this pyramid. If, if you find a hash value of a malware uh, used by a hacker, that is of trivial pain to the hacker. I mean, they, they will change a small little value in the, in the malware file and it's a fresh new hash. And usually hackers will use uh, polymorphic malware anyway. So a hash doesn't really matter. If you go up IP address, domain name, or host or network artifacts, it's becoming quite annoying. And these are things that you can quite easily automate, automatically look for. Now, if you go up to the tools and the, the tactics, uh, techniques and uh, procedures, 
that's where it's going to be really tough for for an attacker if you find out how they're doing that they basically need to start over um but the bottom part at least the low-hanging fruit um we could quite easily um automate and we'll just provide that then to the security analysts and they can then go up to look at the last two layers of this pyramid you don't want to waste time for security analysts on those lower le levels now here's uh, a similar uh, view uh, but basically this states the same thing um, when you do uh, hunting you want to start out with a lot of telemetry points go to items leads but in the end you only want a couple of incidents that come out of your hunt you don't want here's 500 things to look at um, to incident responders if, if, if the hunters actually find something. That doesn't work, obviously. So therefore, uh, you wanna funnel this down and only provide um, useful and actionable insights to your responders when you're done with hunting. So to do that intelligence-driven threat hunting, um, we're gonna combine local context and local context can be anything. It can be endpoint logs, Kubernetes audit logs, flow data, vulnerability scans, or other, other things. We're gonna combine that with global intelligence. And global intelligence, obviously you have all kinds of feeds and reports here like virus total, as was mentioned in the previous presentation, uh, there's paid feeds, et cetera. You can use malware analysis for this. But today I wanna to show you a bit more creative way of getting, gathering intelligence which is through blogs and Twitter, actually. And I'm gonna show them both to you. Now, when you gather that intelligence, you wanna cross-reference it with your local context, and you wanna create actionable insights out of this. So what I mean is that if there is uh, a reference, uh, that a match, um, you can assume that your hypothesis might be true, and you can actually provide actionable insights as in, hey, this domain, uh, there has been a DNS request by this device to that domain. That domain is a fresh command and control server, as we just saw on Twitter. So I would recommend blocking that domain at least, uh, maybe blocking the IP address as well, and trying to clean up that machine. Um, that is very easy insights uh, as a result of a hunt. All right, so we talked a lot already. Um, Let's actually go into more of the meat of the session. Uh, today, I'm using Python as a programming language. Obviously, you can do this in any language that you want. Uh, Python is just my preferred choice. Uh, plus, uh, I studied at the same university where Python actually was invented, uh, the University of Amsterdam. So I always need to promote Python, of course. Um, what I'm also using is SecureX. And SecureX is, um, as I mentioned earlier, it's kind of like a sort tool. And I'll jump a little bit more into what that is right now. Um, so before I do that, I wanted to uh, mention this is not a marketing presentation. I'm just using a Cisco product as an example. Um, but please, uh, when you're listening to this session, you can um, obviously use different tools that, uh, for this as well. Um, now, SecureX um, is a platform. Uh, it's, a, it's a free tool from Cisco, which is included with all kinds of security products that we have. And basically what it allows you to do is it, it uh, allows you to pull in um, both Cisco and third-party local intelligence or local context, as it says on this slide. And it allows you to combine that with uh, intelligence from both Cisco and third-party. So, um, it can be on, on the Cisco side. It can be, for example, uh, Umbrella slash OpenDNS or ThreatGrid. Um, but on the third party side, it can be uh, anything basically, but for example, Virus Total, Shodan, uh, or any, any other type of tool. What it allows you to do is it, uh, it puts all of this information in the same data model. And for everyone that wanted to give Sticks a shout out, this data model is uh, Sticks based. It's a slightly simplified version, but it's completely compatible with Sticks uh, since it's based on it. Um, and what that allows you to do, if you have everything in the same data model, is that you can easily cross-reference it, right? Um, and that is exactly what we 
uh, we want to do. Um, so threat response is a tool within SecureX architecture that allows you to do that. And there's also an orchestration engine in it. Um, today I'm using Python and not this orchestrator to do the workflows uh, because I want it to be um, yeah, easily adaptable for people that don't have this orchestrator as well. Um, as I think I mentioned it uh, before already, but SecureX is an API aggregator basically. So all of these modules that are connected to, uh, to it are uh, API connections as a lot of other tools also uh, do. Um, it's not a SIEM solution, so no data is stored. It only pulls the data when you're doing the actual threat hunt. Um, and uh, also you can take response actions out of it. Uh, some modules are both an input of data as well as a destination for actions. So you see those two on the left and the right there. Um, and obviously as an input, you can use local data, but also global data, or in our case today, uh, we're gonna use Twitter and uh, RSS feeds. Um, just to say completely transparent, here are a couple of alternatives uh, for SecureX. Uh, I haven't touched all of them, so I'm not sure if they have the exact same features, uh, but they all have similar SOAR uh, features. All right. so. Let's jump into the actual first um, use case and demo, uh, which is ingesting uh, information from Twitter. Now, I'm not sure who knows this hashtag here, uh, hashtag open there, but this is quite a famous hashtag that allows you, um, or allows you uh, that, um, what I mean is that ethical ha hackers, but also cybersecurity researchers, they use this to uh, yeah, make public their findings of their research. For example, in this case, you can see a couple of uh, domain names that someone um, posted. Below, you can see a couple of IP addresses. Sometimes it's email addresses, file hashes, anything that is related to uh, uh, attacks, uh, people share via this uh, hashtag. There's probably more hashtags out there, so you can quite easily subscribe my script to multiple of these hashtags. Um, but basically what we're going to do is we're going to find uh, malware indicators in these tweets. Now, my question to you is, do you even have enough time to keep up with your own social media? Probably the answer is no, or if you do, you might uh, wanna focus a bit more on your work um, instead of social media. But the idea here basically is, if you don't have time for your own social media, how are you going to keep track of all of these tweets that might be related to attacks? Now, for that use case, I made this script, which is on my GitHub, and I'll share the link in the Slack um, channel uh, when I'm done presenting. Um, here you see a tweet of mine where I once uh, promoted my, my script on that hashtag, but I obviously also put in a indicator of compromise uh, uh, in there as well. Um, and um, yeah, basically um, the script works as followed. Um, so the first time it runs, it's going to retrieve all tweets. Um, if it didn't uh, run bef uh, or if it did run before, it's going to check if there's new tweets. Um, now, if there are tweets, it's going to parse and clean them. If there are no tweets, it's going to sleep. So you can quite easily put this on a cron job. I've also built that feature in. Um, it's going to retrieve observables using the threat response inspect API. It's going to find observables and with observables, I mean indicators basically, um, but observables can also be clean. Um, it's going to enrich this information. And if there's no indicators in the tweet, it's just gonna skip, skip that tweet. Now it's then going to see if there's actual targets. So are there any devices or machines or um, anything that made a connection or downloaded a file or e uh, got an email from any of these uh, indicators out of the tweet. If so, uh, I'm sending a WebEx Teams alert and creating a case in SecureX. Now, it's quite easy to create a different type of node and a different type of notification. Uh, so it's all quite loosely coupled. Um, and I'm sending also a message if there's no sightings, obviously you might wanna turn that off to reduce noise. Um, 
If there's more tweets, it's going to do the same trick. If not, it's going to sleep. So it's a quite easy, simple script flow, but it's quite powerful in what it can do. Um, so this is the result. Uh, here's two screenshots of the case in SecureX casebook and in, um, a notification message in WebEx Teams. Again, you could change this for Slack or whatever quite easily. Now let's have a look at a demo. So here you see the hashtag open there and uh, you see the similar, um, similar uh, indicators as I mentioned earlier. I'm gonna copy paste these now. Um, but you see these tweets and these tweets come in daily um, and they're often very interesting and they're completely fresh, freshly invented malware. I'm going to can use secure X threat response to manually search for this. And if you don't have a tool like this, it would take even more work. You would need to check multiple internal monitoring systems uh, to see if you have any um, cross references, so any hits. Uh, as you can see here, one of them is unknown. The other is malicious. Malicious domains are probably already blocked by my existing solutions, but the unknown one can be very dangerous. So if I actually have a target, it could be dangerous. Now here we see uh, the Twitter API, and I would definitely recommend applying for a developer account at Twitter. Um, and as you can see, you can also have a since ID here. And this API allows me to search for the most recent um, a tweet. Um, and I'm also using the threat response API module from Cisco uh, threat response um, to do all of the threat response related uh, items. Now here's that script. I'm importing both of these Python modules. Um, all of this is built into function. So it's quite easily to, to rip and replace parts if needed. I have a config file where everything is stored. Here I'm basically parsing the tweets. I'm using a um, API endpoint from threat response to do so, checking for sightings, uh, and I'm only checking for sightings for um, unknown or malicious observables. Here I'm creating a case, and if the case, uh, if the sightings count is one or higher, I'm uh, putting a high priority tag. I'm doing the same in WebEx Teams, and here I'm basically doing the magic with uh, Twitter. I'm using that since ID, which I'm then storing in the config file to make sure that I'm not parsing the same tweet twice. Um, now, as you can see, um, if there are no changes, then I will just print out there's no changes. So no need to uh, run the script again. So the idea is that you can run this every six hours or whatever. So here I'm running the script. Um, and as you can see, a new tweet was detected and a new case was created. Um, and that means there were indicators in it. Um, this case, the fact that it doesn't say high priority means we didn't have any sightings, which is good for us to know. Now back here, we can see the case actually here and being created, and uh, which is quite important for us to know. I can investigate it from here. I can also go to the actual tweet from the case in casebook as well. Uh, so I can do quite a, a lot of stuff from here. Now, as you can see here, this is the important one where I actually have a target. Uh, so that means uh, in this case, I uh, actually have a device in my organization or a machine that actually had contact with it. So this, these are the cases that we wanna offer our security analysts. Probably all of the other ones that don't have targets, we wanna skip. And as you can see here, we do have those two targets. And we see uh, the Twitter message here and the high priority tag. So I just wanted to sum up what we just saw. Um, what we did is we took in tweets that are using the hashtag open deer. We're searching for indicators of compromise or, or any indicators in that tweet. We're then cross-referencing it with our local uh, intelligence or our local context. If we do have any hits, any matches, we're uh, alerting our security operations center staff and telling them, hey, this is something you need to research. Um, the nice thing of this is we're basically automating a lot of threat hunting um, uh, components here. Now the next one, and which I'm gonna do in the last couple of minutes is 
uh, we can do the exact same thing with blog posts using RSS feeds. And there's many blogs out there. So I have a script um, that goes and searches these blogs. And every time there's a new blog post, it will search for indicators and it will do the exact same trick as we can do with Twitter. Um, and again, how does an analyst keep track of all of these blog posts? And how would it do a threat hunt based on those blog posts? It's very difficult to do. So I would recommend checking out this uh, GitHub and I'll share it in the Slack uh, channel in a bit. And there's a demo video uh, on YouTube uh, that is listed on that GitHub as well. So um, yeah, basically this is the same trick, um, but a different source. And I challenge you to find other sources. If you do have cool suggestions, feel free to uh, do a pull request on any of my GitHub uh, repos or open an issue or send me a message, of course. Um, and now let's wrap up our session. I just wanted to ask you, is this easier than manually searching Twitter? I think it is. Um, I think that a lot of threat hunting can be done automatically and it should be done automatically. And this is a continuous process. So um, yeah, with that, I'm um, closing again with the same statement. And uh, I hope this makes a bit more sense. And uh, if you have any questions, please feel free to contact me. Right. Thanks, Chris Burry. Yeah, I think I think the focus on automation is is great here because a lot of us get into this part where like, yeah, we have a successful hunt that we did like, uh, you know, how do we make sure we're not wasting our time doing it over and over again, especially tied with the pyramid. Of course, I'm automatically in favor of tying things with the pyramid. Uh, <laughs> when you're talking about like uh, doing some automation, I think of it a lot of a lot like automating some of the um, lower pyramid level tier things so that you can have your analysts focus on on some of the higher level things. So that's that seems like a pretty good approach to me. Uh, there's a couple of questions in the Slack channel, and maybe I'll combine them a little bit because I think they're on the same theme, really. Uh, one is, with this system, could a malicious tweet result in a bunch of false positive alerts? But then the other part of that is, could could a, a malicious tweet also like create a, a denial of service for the SOC by adding a bunch of like real sites into the into the Twitter feed? Yeah, that's a great question. And uh, when I was testing with this, uh, when I was writing those scripts, I got a lot of noise and I DDoS myself a couple of times. And I actually had to uh, parse through all of those cases that I created to delete them because it was getting a mess. Uh, I do have one thing which I've built in. So what I'm doing right now is I'm uh, using a couple of thread feeds to cross-reference the tweet. If there is a clean observable in there, so like google.com, I'm throwing it away anyway. And what I'm also suggesting, and there's a, the option in my script to do so, is that only if you actually have a device or a, a target, so someone actually reached out to a domain or uh, executed a file on, on their machine, only then create a ticket for your uh, security operation channel. So um, yeah. So you could uh, you could DDoS it basically, but only there will there will be only be notifications if you actually have a device in your environment that reached out, um, made a connection, or executed a file. Um, so I hope that reduces a lot of noise. Is there any um, anything you have to be concerned about? For example, if someone posts posts the open door hashtag with uh, Google.com or something like that. Yeah, so, so uh, a, a great question. So, so I'm um, actually filtering out those type of, of clean domains or clean uh, indicators. I'm filtering them out uh, because uh, especially uh, blog posts, they contain a lot of mentions to, I don't know, a newsletter like theguardian.com. And I noticed that that caused like a lot of false positives. So I'm filtering out all, uh, everything that's marked as clean. Anything that's unknown, malicious, or suspicious, I am keeping in there. Um, so as long as it's uh, clean, it will be filtered out. Okay, well, perfect. 
Well, I know you have a number of people in your hallway Slack channel waiting to talk to you and ask you even more questions. So <laughs> thanks very much for a really interesting presentation on the threat hunting process and the 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 automation of of that and uh, for the cool tool demos too. So thank you very much. It was a pleasure being here.